good evening, everybody. Um, it is lovely once again to have so many of you on board with us. Um, it's a lovely evening where I am. Don't know what the evening is like where you are, but uh, it's beautiful outside as I look out my window. So it always surprises me that we get so many people um, uh, attending our presentations. Of course, we're absolutely delighted um, about that. Um, this evening's talk uh, is about a national park that I nearly got to last year, um, but failed by a whisker because um, COVID intervened and uh, prevented me and the rest of our group from, from getting out um, to India at all, let alone to um, Nagaholi National Park. Uh, so I, for one, am looking forward to this talk enormously. Um, I don't know if Brett's worked really hard to put this together. Um, for those of you that are unfamiliar with Brett, um, Brett is in a marketing department at Wildlife Worldwide. Brett is uh, an outstanding photographer and uh, you will see evidence of that during the course of this evening's presentation if you are um, by any chance unfamiliar with, uh, with Brett's photography. Um, uh, you will certainly be familiar with it by the end of the evening um, and it really is absolutely wonderful. Uh, and of course, Brett leads, um, in addition to um, designing our brochures and, and, and working on um, a lot of our uh, marketing material, um, Brett leads many of our trips. Um, where to, Brett? Remind me, all over the place. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, from Europe to Africa, um, to, um, you name it, pretty much anywhere, really. Australia. <laughs> Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, well, look, for, for those of you that are on board, and as I say, there are many, um, I, I know Brett will be absolutely delighted to answer questions at the end. Um, and I suspect that all of you that are on board this evening have um, uh, attended one of our presentations in the past. But, um, but if you haven't, please do feel free to make use of the chat facility, which is at the bottom of your screen. Um, or the Q&A facility, which is also at the bottom of your screen. Um, and um, we'll, we'll, we'll take questions. And please feel free to ask questions at any stage during the course of the, the presentation, but we'll, um, we'll actually have a Q&A session at the end. Um, so, Brett, shall I, uh, shall I hand over to you and I can drink my can of Coke? <laughs> no problem. <laughs> over to you. Good evening, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us again. Um, it's a pleasure to have you all here with us. Um, so today, as Chris said, I'm talking to you about Nagaholi National Park. Um, and to be honest, up until a few years ago, I really hadn't ever heard of it. Uh, I'm not going to lie. Uh, and then suddenly some amazing news started coming out about these incredible sightings and um, it got us all very excited. And uh, in 2019, I think it was, I was able to go. I can't keep track with COVID um, changes to our calendar and things like that. I, I'm very lost with, with dates and when things were, but I was able to lead one of our tours, one of our first tours. Um, and all I can say is having traveled widely around uh, India and seen a huge amount of wildlife and visited pretty much all the tiger reserves that most people sort of think of, um, I was blown away by Nagaholi. So yeah, tune in. Uh, hopefully I can keep you entertained and um, I'll start off giving you a little bit of an idea of where Nagaholi is. So most of the tiger reserves in India and the traditional wildlife reserves are up in central northern India is probably the best way to put it. Sort of between Nagpur and then up to Delhi and then you've got Rantambur to the northwest which is a little bit sort of isolated I suppose. Um, but what we do is we fly direct from the UK to Bangalore or Bengaluru as it is now. Um, and it's a great flight. We typically fly with British Airways, nice and straightforward. And from there, um, what we do is after we arrive, um, we drive to Nagaholi National Park, which is sort of in the, the Western Ghats mountain range, but on the Eastern side of it. We drive through Mysore, um, which is a, a a hustly bustly kind of place as I'm sure you can imagine with any sort of Indian conurbation um, and then we drive on to Nagaholi National Park. The drive in total takes about four and a half to five hours. The road conditions actually are very good for the whole way um, and we drive in an air-conditioned bus so it's all very comfortable um, and then we arrive at uh, Kabini River Lodge and I have to say it's one of the most 
beautiful spots of any lodge I've been to in India. Um, it's situated on the banks of the Kabini backwaters, which is a, a reservoir um, on, on a river system. And it's sort of, a, I guess, a colonial style uh, a Raj hunting lodge, I suppose, once upon a time. But now it's a, a fantastic sort of locally run, government run uh, accommodation option that provides the tours into uh, Nagaholi National Park. And it actually sort of runs all the operations for the park as well. So if you go, go to another lodge, you actually have to come to Kabini River Lodge to, to actually stay, uh, to, sorry, actually go on safari. So that's a really important thing to say. So it's fantastic that you're here because you get sort of the drivers and everything all at your door. You don't have to drive from one place to the next. It's about a five to 10 minute drive into the park itself, um, but that really isn't a problem. Uh, and it's good roads all the way there. So this is the lodge itself. It's very, very comfortable. Um, en suite rooms, and no problem at all. The food is traditionally Indian, um, but it's not hot and spicy. It's beautifully cooked, uh, amazing service, uh, and as much food as you can eat, really. It, it really is fantastic. So it's a fantastic place to go um, for a week. So we base ourselves there for an entire week, and it just provides you with the perfect base um, to explore the park. Um, I have to say not all of the images in this presentation are mine, um, although Chris sort of talked highly about my photography, and that's because I've only been there myself for one trip, so I haven't built up a huge array of images, and I went as a tour leader, not as a photographer, um, so I didn't take that many pictures. So if you see a name in the bottom right hand corner, um, thank you very much to the, the photographer that's kindly let us use them for uh, our marketing purposes, and, and in this case in my talk. So if you're wondering what the vehicles are like, um, in lots of Indian parks, you get a Maruti Suzuki, a little sort of um, sort of off-road vehicle, I suppose. They're, they're not the, the best off-roaders, but they do the job, um, open top. And in uh, Nagaholi, we have these uh, sort of specially made safari vehicles, much more like a sort of African safari vehicle. And uh, you get a driver who sometimes is a naturalist uh, and sometimes you get a driver and a naturalist, it depends. Um, but on our trips, typically what happens is um, we send an, a fantastic local guide called Ashwin uh, and then we have a driver and they work together to find the wildlife for us. I actually replaced um, Ashwin uh, when I led the tour to, to Nagaholi myself. So the vehicles are fantastic and if you're interested in photography, um, although it's not a photography tour, as you can see the vehicles are nice and open so it provides some, some great opportunities. So you drive into the park and you see the most beautiful artwork along the roads um, and there's a road that sort of runs through two different zones. So actually Nagaholi National Park itself is a vast area, a vast protected area, but there are currently only two different tourist zones, zone A and zone B. Um, and as is the way with these things, one of the zones is fantastic uh, for particularly for certain big cats. Uh, and the other one is a lot more varied. You don't know what you're going to see. Um, so it's a, a slightly different habitat. And it's quite interesting to see that uh, the differences in between those zones and the wildlife that you see as well. Um, zone A, the sort of core zone has the real sort of, I guess, um, prime territory for the big cats and and they're very used to seeing people which uh, well, in vehicles obviously which always helps so you drive in and there's the most beautiful artwork and it's just a great teaser I would say uh, as to what you will hopefully see and obviously with any wildlife holiday I, we can't guarantee you're going to see it but you know it sort of whets the appetite and, and gets you on board and as is the way with any Indian parks, um, I would say the first things you see are the birds and a lot of the sort of um, non-predatory mammals as well. So the birds you can expect to see Indian roller uh, and then sort of familiar species on, on any Afri uh, um, African and Indian safari, um, such as the flameback woodpeckers. Uh, you get your paradise flycatchers, uh, Indian cuckoos, plum-headed parakeets, Malabar parakeets. Um, it really is very very special as a birding destination, but there's so much more on offer, obviously. And um, this is a yellow footed green pigeon, really beautiful bird. Um, and one of the things as well about this forest is that the bird song is incredible, um, particularly with lots of barbets singing. The Indian cuckoos are always going. 
Um, it's really, really very special. And the coppersmith barbet is probably the most prolific of the barbet species when, they, when it's cooling. Um, this image is by Lance Tuckett. So thank you, Lance, for sending me your images. So very much appreciated. He was actually on the trip with me. Um, so the things he photographed, I was able to see, but wasn't necessarily photographing at the time. So Indian safaris are different, I would say, um, from an African safari. And a lot of people ask why they're different. And I think one of the fundamental ways that an Indian safari is different from an African safari is that you're relying so much on the sounds um, of the forest. And I don't just mean um, sort of the sounds of the animals that are, are you know, the animals that are making the sounds, what they're doing is they're telling you a story. And that story is usually about where a predator is or a, an interest is or something that they're not sure of. And whether that be birds or monkeys or deer um, calling in the forest, all of this thing tells a story. And you sit still. And what I love about an Indian safari is you sit down, sit down in the vehicle, turn off the engine and you just listen. And then you hear that call of a langur, um, such as this, a Hanuman langur, a grey langur, or you hear the call of a deer and the world just sort of gets a whole nother level of excitement. It really does. And the langurs are probably one of the best indicators of predators around. Um, and they're very habituated to people, very cheeky. And you can easily see um, many of them in, in one game drive. And even around the lodge, there are, are both langurs and, and macaques as well, which I'll, I'll get into in a bit. A bonnet macaque is the species that you'll find here. Um, but these langurs, as I said, are an early warning system for predators. And that primarily means big cats. And actually they have different calls for leopards and tigers because leopards can climb trees and tigers can't. So if there's a leopard, they have a certain call. And if it's a tiger, it's another call. So it helps you to really build up that picture. And all the while the adrenaline is building um, and you sort of start to pinpoint where the calls are coming from. And then you journey to that point. And it's so exciting and slightly different from your African safari in that sense. Although sometimes obviously you do rely on the sounds as well. The other big calls um, to rely on are, are the calls of the deer and different species are sort of, I guess, more reliable warning systems. So this is a Samba deer. Um, they're the largest deer in the forest. And if they call, it's usually a pretty good sign that there's a predator around. And because they're big and um, they're quite confident compared to some of the other deer species. So if they see something um, that's sort of a threat, they really will bark incredibly loudly. It's a really strong dominant call that you can hear resonate through the forest. So if one of these guys calls, you take it pretty seriously and it's worth investigating. However, if a cheetah calls the spotted deer, then you have to take it with a pinch of salt because they're not that reliable. They're ultra skittish and any movement in the vegetation or a sound that they're not sure what made it, um, they're likely to call. So if you hear a couple of calls quite early on, um, maybe don't trust them too much, but if they keep going and then they get more incessant, uh, more vocal, then it's time to start thinking that there might be something out there uh, and you to take uh, the time to investigate. But of course, it's not only big cats in, in India um, that provide such interest to the visitors. They also have the Asiatic wild dog or the dole, um, which for, is one of my favorite predators in India. They are beautiful, this reddish brown color, um, sort of halfway between the size of a red fox and an African wild dog, if, you, if you're wondering. Um, like the African wild dog, they're in their own sort of genus. They're not actually part of the dog family, so to speak, um, but they're not, in, not a wolf or anything. They're sort of in their own separate lineage, um, but closely related nonetheless. And um, these dogs form small packs, um, sometimes quite large, but these family groups and they're incredibly efficient hunters. And the cheetah um, in particular are preyed upon by these dogs. So they are very nervous when they see them and partly because the dogs are very tenacious and very fit, fast, and they will run through the forest chasing down their prey uh, until eventually the deer trips or something like that. So these dogs are fantastic. And actually these were one of the first things I saw predatory wise when I went to Nagaholi. And I saw a pack of wild dogs every day I was in the park, which is quite remarkable, really, considering you can actually see in this image the density of the vegetation. And that's another thing that's important to say about Nagaholi. There are certain areas which are quite open um, and very beautiful deciduous forests. Uh, and then there are some thick sort of lantana filled type 
forest where you've got open trees and then very thick scrub. And it provides a perfect mosaic habitat for all these different species to coexist. So you can get leopards, tigers and wild dogs all on one game drive. And you really can, as well as the, obviously the prey species and the other mammals and the birds and the, the reptiles as well that all call this area home. So the wild dogs for me are, are one of my favourites, as I said, um, and they have absolutely no fear of people. And what's great is if you park up, they quite often will run straight past you. Um, so whether you're interested just to watch them from a behavioural point of view or take photographs, um, the wild dogs are fantastic. I usually refer to them as doll. Um, it's sort of their traditional name, I suppose. Uh, and they really are these beautiful, beautiful mammals. And if you're really lucky, you might get to see pups. And I know um, other groups, not my, my own, um, saw very young pups uh, and even dogs make a kill as well. So it's entirely possible. Um, and you really never know what you're going to see in any game drive. And that's what's always, for me, the most exciting is, is that sort of mystery, that intrigue, not knowing what's going to, to be on offer. Um, but the wild dogs are, are a really great sort of species to watch. Um, and the photographic opportunities and just the sort of delight they bring it, it is exceptional. Uh, and it's the perfect, for me, introduction into Nagaholi because it gives you a, a glimpse of just what's on offer. Uh, and it really is, I think, probably the most varied park I've been to in India, other than maybe Kazaranga, which is up in Assam in northeast India. And that's just because that's such a different habitat. Um, but Nagaholi is just, I don't know, it's got something about it. And it's important to say as well the time of year we go. So primarily we go through February, from February um, through to April. Um, and this is because it's the dry season, it's before the monsoon rains, um, and there's less water around. And that brings um, prey species such as deer um, to, to drink, wild boar, um, even gar, which I'll, I'll move on to shortly. It brings them into drink uh, in a sort of, they're more reliant on, on permanent water sources and, and therefore predators um, stay closer to those water sources. So it's really interesting to see the dynamic and the behaviours um, of how the animals drink uh, and how that correlates to sort of the predators moving in um, and sticking to these core areas where, where they find their prey. So whilst you're on a game drive, of course, it isn't just about the predators. And whilst you're sat listening and waiting, there's so much going on around you. As I said, the bird life is exceptional. Many different species uh, are on offer from ground birds and grey jungle fowl are here, um, sandpipers, uh, you name it, there's so much on offer. Um, and you just can't sort of stop seeing things. There's something always around, lots of bird of prey, brown fish owls, um, changeable hawk eagles, Bramley kites even flying around. You really don't know what's going to be around any corner. Indian rollers like you saw on the intro slide as well. But then the mammals are equally diverse as the birds. So I talked about the gar. It's a member of the bovine family. Um, it's not a true cow uh, and it's not a bison either, although they're often referred to as Indian bison. But the males can weigh a ton um, and are a, a real match for obviously any predator, but a tiger in particular. However, they're young and the females uh, are much smaller. Um, much more delicate um, and can be taken down by big cats and even big males can be but uh, they can put up quite a fight um, and these animals are like all the wildlife in Nagaholi uh, very relaxed around the vehicles um, and one of the really important things as well to say about Nagaholi is there are incredibly strict numbers on the vehicles at any in any zone I should say um, so you're never going to have those crowds around a tiger like you get in the northern parks. Um, I'm thinking of sort of Rantambor, uh, Bandavgar, um, you know, these places where you can get sort of just far too many jeeps crowding around a tiger. That just doesn't happen in Nagaholi. And yes, you can get multiple vehicles at a sighting, but for the most part, um, you can have many sightings to yourself in this beautiful, pristine sort of ecosystem. And it is just heavenly. I mean, there's no better thing for me than having your own private sighting uh, without any other vehicles and no engine noises um, and just switching off the engine and just watching the world go by and watching these magnificent species as they, they sit in front of you. Um, so just to give you an idea of, of the gar and sort of the proximity to a vehicle, here's just a little video for you and it just gives you an idea of um, sort of 
the relaxed nature of the wildlife here, it, and it also gives you an idea of the landscape. You can see there's this sort of open forest in front of me, and then beyond that, there's a thick lantana scrub. Um, so it's a, it gives you a really good idea of the habitat um, in some parts of the park compared to others. And you'll see some more images later on, um, which will give you an idea of the habitat on offer. One of the other brilliant things about Nagaholi, which you just don't get in those northern parks, is the fact they're a wild Asian elephant and they are very common. Um, and you'll see large males, you'll see breeding family groups. Sometimes they can be quite skittish. Um, other times they can be very relaxed. It, you really don't know, but it's fantastic to be driving through the forest and for a herd of elephants just to emerge in front of you, walking through the trees. And it's just magical in India to see wild Asian elephants in a forest environment, because unfortunately it's quite rare these days in lots of, lots of India. Not so much in Southern India where Nagaholi is in that Southwestern sort of um, corners in the Western Ghats and things like that. There's a good population. But in the north, you just don't see it. So it's really wonderful um, to be able to enjoy these animals in the park. Again, thanks to Lance for this image. Um, this is a female and we saw, I think we saw elephants every day we were there and we saw some youngsters, but the mothers are very protective and they always keep them away from you on sort of the other side uh, of themselves. But for the most part, they're very relaxed um, and they'll just watch you as, as you go by and they will quite literally cross the road in front of you. So it adds a whole, other dimension to the tour, uh, to a tiger trip, I guess. It, normally, sort of an Indian tiger safari is about the big cats um, and relying on the deer and the cheetah, but here there's so much more on offer, um, and that's really, really fantastic. Also in Nagaholi, um, I talked about the, the Kabini backwaters, this sort of reservoir um, that they have. It's actually navigable by boat. Um, so what's really lovely is you can actually take a boat trip along one of the, the edges of one of the zones um, and you can see the wildlife. It isn't unheard of to see big cats, particularly tigers walking, um, but you can see Asian elephants such as this. Um, and you can also see otters and, and a wide range of birds. This image was um, given to us when, after his trip, John Isaacs. So thank you, John, when you let us use this image. Um, I've included it today because I didn't get any images of otter, um, but they are there and they're very regularly seen. It's a great place for, for um, waterfowl as well, uh, heron species, kingfishers, lots of pied kingfishers around. Um, you you can, just can't keep up with what's going on around you. It really is very special. spot billed ducks are very common and there are also good spots to see river tern, purple herons, intermediate egrets, great egrets, you know, they really are all there. Um, and there's so much to see at any time, um, whether it's the bird life or the mammals um, or, or even the reptiles as well. You quite often see monitor lizards walking around the foreshore uh, and there's just always something on offer. Uh, it's just a nice little um, interlude, I suppose, to any trip in Nagaholi National Park. And the best thing is, about this trip as well is that the boats run directly from the lodge. So you don't have to go anywhere uh, after sort of, you know, your lunch or, or in the morning. Um, you can just sort of wander down to the jetty and hop on the boat. And obviously life jackets and things are, are always available. Um, and it's important to say that like a traditional safari, tiger safari in India, um, there is a morning and an evening game drive, um, afternoon game drive with a lunch in the middle. Um, obviously the middle of the day can be very hot, so the forest is very quiet. So it's those first couple of hours in the morning and the last couple of, couple of hours before it gets dark that are absolutely key uh, for any safari in India. If you're really lucky in Nagaholi, you might get to see sloth bear. Um, this bear actually, I saw way in the distance. I just happened to be scanning. We were sat um, at sort of the bottom of a hill and way in the distance along the tree line, I could just see this black lump. And then the black lump started to move and I turned my binoculars to it. And sure enough, it was a sloth bear and it was completely completely engrossed in this termite mound. It had absolutely no idea we were there and we drove up to it really slowly. Um, and I didn't get any pictures at all because I was sort of at the back of the vehicle and, and trying to make sure that everybody saw it. Um, but Lance managed to get this fantastic shot. Um, and eventually it, it realized we were there and sloth bears here are quite skittish um, and it just turned and ran. Um, and actually on another occasion, we saw another sloth bear uh, Again, we caught it by surprise and it did the same thing, but we got remarkably close to both of them. But on this particular drive, 
um, as it disappeared into the forest, a herd of elephants actually appeared uh, and started to walk along the road. Most of them then slowly disappeared uh, and the one elephant sort of kept on looking into the vegetation, this thick scrub uh, to one side of the road. And so the guides and myself, we sort of were looking at each other and we're thinking there must be something there because this elephant was quite agitated. As you can see in this photograph, its foot is up and it kept sort of scraping the ground. Its ears were flapping. It obviously wasn't happy and it kept on scenting using its trunk uh, to catch the scent of whatever was in, in the vegetation to one side of it. It turned out to be the sloth bear again and before long it reappeared on the road um, at the bottom of the hill where we actually first sort of where I first spotted it. Um, so we hadn't moved, we'd stayed put and it disappeared down the hill and, and reappeared again. So to see a wild Asian elephant and a sloth bear at the same time is something I've definitely never done um, and I have been on countless game drives in, in, in India. Um, it's really really very special so to see both was exceptional um, and to see them both in Nagaholi makes it even more uh, sort of special just because um, you don't often see the sloth bear at all, let alone at the same time as an elephant. But of course, most people, when they're going to an Indian reserve, they want to see the big cats and who can blame them? To see big cats in the wild is spine tingling, it's magical and tigers, well, they're probably up there at the top of everybody's list. They really are the most magical big cat. There's just something incredible about them. And as I said before, you find a tiger very rarely by spotting it. Sometimes they'll walk out in front of you and I've got a few images later on where that happens, but you will normally hear something happening first and then if you're lucky, the tiger emerges. And sometimes this is all you get, this kind of view. And it just goes to show how fantastic their camouflage is. You know, if you were just driving along a road at high speed, you might not notice this big cat, even if it was 20 feet from you because of the vegetation and those stripes breaking up its, its body shape. But on this particular time, we'd heard many calls and then this tigress just started to walk through the vegetation. We knew it was in there somewhere and then it got up and started to walk. It'd been spotted, it wasn't happy and was moving away. And she started to walk towards a waterhole. And so we knew that she was probably gonna keep walking in that direction. This female actually had cubs and she was situated, had situated the cubs maybe 300 meters away from the waterhole. So what we did is we went to the track um, that sort of dissected where the waterhole, uh, the path from where her location was to the waterhole and we waited and eventually she appeared uh, from the thick vegetation and walked out across right in front of you. And I can honestly say that you never get bored of seeing a tiger. And I'm sure many of you listening today have been to India um, and will say the same thing. For many people, it makes them cry. It's, there's an overwhelming emotional response to seeing a wild tiger. Partly, I think it's the size obviously the stripes and I think it's just the aura they have about them and I think it's also that build-up that sound um I don't know it's just the sound backdrop behind behind them everything is building up to that moment and then when you see it out in the open your emotions just kind of get the better of you and you can't help yourself you get uh, emotional about this incredible big cat and if you're interested in tigers, I can assure you Nagaholi is sublime. Um, I think we actually saw 14 different tigers um, sightings, I should say, uh, sort of over the course of the week. Um, but many of those were um, actual, well, you'll see in a bit, I'll get onto that in a moment. Um, but it was, it's an amazing place, Nagaholi. And you can see here the vegetation and the landscape is quite different to where the um, the gal were earlier, that little video with sort of the open forest. This is very thick scrub and very dry area, um, whereas other bits are, are much more lush. Um, and it, it all depends on, on sort of the tree type, the water availability, obviously. Um, so it, it's always changing. And just to see a tiger in its natural environment, you really can't beat it. And again, a completely different vegetation type. 
This is actually because there's a water source next to it, but it gives you an idea again of just how hard to see uh, a tiger is. There's actually four tigers in this frame, but you can only really see one. Uh, and then there's sort of two diagonally um, right, top right of the tiger that you can probably hopefully see in the middle. And then there's one directly to the right of it as well. So there are four tigers. There's actually five in the area. It's a mother with four cubs, um, but it gives you an idea of, of the, the health of the population here. A tigress with four cubs nearly at adulthood is pretty remarkable, almost unheard of. So this was an amazing thing to witness, you know, all of these grown tiger cubs all still together. And eventually they did sort of show themselves and started to move around through the thick vegetation, but it was no easy feat to get a photograph, I must say. Um, and it took a, a lot of patience and I have to say our guides were fantastic, our local guides. Their ability, number one, to spot wildlife, to interpret the sounds, look for pug marks on the tracks, um, and then to see the animal through the thickest vegetation you can imagine. Um, my hat goes off to them, their tenacity and their brilliant sort of natural history knowledge really can't go uh, um, un un unnoticed. I, I couldn't thank them enough for all their help. But it's magical to see these tigers in the natural environment. And OK, these might not be the best photographic opportunities you're ever going to have, but it doesn't matter. For me, it's all about that wildlife and, and that sort of emotional response to seeing a big cat in its natural environment. So throughout the week, we had some prolonged sightings with tigers, such as the two you've just seen, where you got to spend maybe 10 or 15 minutes. We also had some moments where we knew there was a tiger within 20 meters of where we were. Could we see it? No, but we absolutely knew it was there. The langurs were calling, the cheetah, samba deer were calling, elephant trunks were swaying, and you just know that the, the tiger is sort of resting up in, in the shade, um, annoyed that it's been spotted and desperately hoping that everything goes away and leaves it alone. But sometimes you're driving along and you've not seen anything. And then suddenly, before you know it, a tiger just emerges in front of you. This was one of those moments. We were literally driving along the track and the tiger just appeared from the scrub um, right next to us. It was just a freak encounter, but the very best kind. There were no alarm calls, absolutely nothing. And we were just sort of gently driving along and the tiger emerged right next to us. Um, and then this was a, another encounter, um, only I think the very next day. But for me, the best encounter um, was we had heard about a tiger sighting um, over the other side of the zone from where we were and other people had left it and gone. And we thought, oh, well, we'll make our way over there. And as we were making our way over there, this huge male tiger just appeared from the forest and it just nonchalantly strolled in front of us. And then just as it got to the road, just to the edge of the track, it just turned and looked at us and it just stared directly at us. And I can assure you at this point, um, you have got goosebumps all over your body. Uh, and this was, to give you an idea, if anybody's a photographer, this was taken on a 300 mil at full frame. I, I literally couldn't fit it in in any other way. And he was a spectacular tiger. Um, and it only lasted probably the sighting for less than a minute, but it's a moment I will genuinely never forget. It really is that special to see these amazing cats in the wild. Um, I, I don't really know how to put it into words, to be honest, because it is just one of those moments that will stick with me forever. But again, so much more on offer, and as well as those langurs I was talking about, you get, get bonnet macaques, and actually these guys are really often found around the lodge and can be a little bit cheeky and naughty. Um, you might actually be able to see this one's pouches are quite full of food. I think it had been stealing food from the buffet. Um, so be wary if you've got food around them, they are quite cheeky, but they're also very approachable um, when you're around the lodge uh, and, and fascinating to watch. They're great to, to watch sort of sitting under a tree or in the shade um, of your room, watching them look around, looking around for food uh, and whilst you're having a nice drink and, and a, a read as well. And one important thing to say about uh, Nagaholi and Kabini River Lodge is it has a bar. And I know some places in India are dry. Uh, Nagaholi is not, uh, and there is a bar, so, and it's fantastic. So that's always much appreciated.
there's so much more uh, on offer throughout the park and um, giant squirrels um, always in the treetops and fascinating to watch. And I mean, they really are giant, sort of four times the size of a gray squirrel, I would say, and um, pretty monstrous things. Thank you again, Lance, for this fantastic photograph. Um, beautiful, beautiful animals uh, and really, really sort of cheeky and charismatic as they're leaping through the tree treetops. Um, but it's also great for other small mammals on the ground and particularly the mongooses and um, striped necked mongoose are particularly common um, and sort of quite sort of active during the day. So when the forest is quieter with the big predators, you quite often see the smaller ones. Um, we saw quite a few striped mongoose throughout our, our, our trip uh, and got some pretty good photographs of them. We also saw this quite remarkable moment. It was a, a dead monitor lizard. We weren't sure what had killed it, um, but it's a ruddy mongoose that's feasting on it. And we watched this probably for, for 25 minutes. It wasn't the reason we actually stopped. We knew there was a tiger um, on the other side of the water hole uh, where this mongoose was feeding. And we were actually waiting um, for the tigress to, to hopefully appear with her cubs. It was the one you actually saw earlier on um, walking through that really thick scrub. But unfortunately, she didn't show herself. But it doesn't really matter when you're on a safari uh, such as this, because there is always something else on offer. And watching this unique behaviour was pretty spectacular. Uh, and there was also a, a tree pie that took a disliking to it at one point and, and did make a bit of a dive at it. Um, so you really don't know what's going to be around the corner. Also, there are barking deer here, wild boar. Um, it really is an amazing place for all sorts of species. And I can't recommend it enough. Of course, peacocks all over the place. And they're another bird that will quite often make an alarm call. Um, but you hear them more often than not, and you see them displaying um, with these spectacular tail feathers, um, quite often walking along the roads. Again, very little fear of the vehicles. Um, and they'll quite often show off just to you, even if there's not another male around as well. So it's a brilliant, brilliant place um, for, for so many different things. Again, a slightly different landscape for you. And I've just thrown this in to give you an idea of this habitat type. And the cheetah are the primary prey of this species. And if you can't see it, um, follow the right hand trunk. And then in the middle is a leopard just poking its head out from underneath the leaf litter, uh, the leaf litter, the leaf foliage on the tree. Um, and actually, this is typically how a sighting of a leopard started for us in Nagaholi when I was there. You'd see a flick of a tail or you would hear an alarm call and movement in the bushes and then there was a leopard and I think over the course of the week we saw seven different leopards so we had 14 tigers seven different leopards wild dogs every day two sloth bear I think we had Asian elephant every day um, you know it really is just mind-blowing as to the diversity of the wildlife but the leopards are fantastic and I know I know lots of you are tuning in thinking that there is a particular leopard that you're interested in. We'll get to that in a minute. But it just gives you an idea of how incredible um, the camouflage is on these cats, as well as the tigers. The leopards can just disappear. But sometimes you'll quite literally see a tiger drive around the corner and you'll see a leopard. There, there really is an unusual concentration of both predators in a very confined area. And it's something I've never experienced before in India. I've been to Tadaba, um, Pench, Kana, uh, Bandavgar, uh, Panna, all sorts of places. And I've seen both leopards and I've seen tigers, but you normally see leopards in one place and you see tigers in another place. It's rare that you see them in such close proximity on the same game drive, uh, let alone in the same area in the week. It really is quite remarkable. And, and not only that, we saw multiple leopards at a time. We quite often saw two young leopards up in a tree at the same time. We saw large male leopards, female leopards. We didn't see any young cubs, but that's the way it goes. But it gives you a real idea of the habitat and how tricky it can be to spot them at first. But once you get your eye in and with the help of the local guides, there are some fantastic sightings to be had. I'm really lucky to have seen a lot of leopards in Africa, but I hadn't seen a huge number in India. So for me, this was a real treat and something that will, um, well, it has me wanting to go back to Nagaholi. If I could go back, I would. I know India at the moment is in, in, in a real sort of difficult position, but I actually spoke um, to our local guide Ashwin today, and he was saying that Nagaholi itself 
um, was open up until recently and the sightings have been absolutely exceptional. So the wildlife is still there. And thanks to domestic tourism in India, it's still protected and thriving, which is fantastic to hear. So the leopards are an added bonus, really, I suppose. You've got beautiful tigers, amazing leopards from elegant females such as this um, to one that's a, a little bit sort of mystical. I don't know if you can see there's a, a black shape in a tree. And unfortunately for me, this was the best encounter I got. Not long before I went, he'd been involved in a big fight um, with another leopard. Actually, this isn't it. Sorry, this is a female. Um, but this male leopard here, and you might be able to see that on the right hand side, there's a leopard with a big hole in his face. Turned out that the black leopard, affectionately known as Blackie, I'm not sure it's the best name, but that is what he's known as. And the locals will refer to him as that. So be aware to, to have that sort of being spoken about quite regularly. He actually keeps having a fight with this other large male. Uh, and so far he keeps coming off on top. Um, but who knows how long that will last. Fingers crossed, he keeps going uh, and, and keeps reproducing. He has had cubs, but as yet I'm led to believe there are no black cubs, but we will hopefully uh, have that change in the near future. One of the great things about uh, Nagaholi is you can pretty much stay until last light. And so you never know what you're gonna see as you leave. More often than not, it's elephants as they sort of come out of the forest feed on the grasses. But on one particular day, this leopard actually walked out right in front of us as we left the park. So you really, really have to keep your wits about you and don't give up just because you think you're heading home. You don't know what might be around the next corner. Um, here's another image from Lance, just to give you an idea of, of the amazing sightings we had on our trip of leopards. It really was quite spectacular. So thanks Lance for that. But I know so many of you are interested in this black cat and he really is the star of the show. Um, unfortunately, I didn't get any photographs like this. This one is taken by Ashwin, our guide, and he has some incredible photographs just taken on his mobile phone, videos. I've actually got a few videos that have been sent to us um, from the last sort of few months, actually, uh, of the sightings on offer. But it just gives you an idea of how incredible some of the encounters are. And then we've also got some photographs which were provided for um, to us by Barastres Photography. And these guys um, have visited Nagaholi many times and built up some amazing images and have kindly let us use them to promote the trip. Genuinely, our clients have had some encounters such as this. They really have on, on multiple departures. It just so happened on my trip with Lance uh, and the other members of my wonderful group um, that the cat actually, what happened is quite amazing. We heard all these alarm calls in the trees um, and then we were scanning and there was no sign of him at all. And then we caught some sort of myself and the local guide at the same time saw movement in the tree. We both put our binoculars up as fast as we possibly could to see a black leopard climbing up a tree with a cheetah deer fawn in its sort of in its grasp, had it in its mouth and its claw by this point as it was on the branch. But unfortunately, he decided he was not going to sit on the branch that we could all see, and he climbed behind the main tree trunk. So we really didn't get any fantastic photographs, but it was nonetheless amazing to see. Um, we just wish we had that clear, clear sighting of him. But this is the kind of sighting that happens all too often for, for many people that visit, and I hate them for it, and which is one of the reasons I have to go back. Uh, I mean, how can you not want to go and see a cat as spectacular as this? I mean, isn't it the most beautiful thing you've ever seen? Unfortunately, thanks to his boyish antics and his fighting with that other male, he has got a few scars on his face now, but nonetheless, he is one spectacular cat. So I've got a couple of videos just to end with um, for tonight, just to give you an idea of the type of encounters uh, on offer. This is by one of our clients, um, just taken as the cat sort of emerges in front of them and you can see he's incredibly nonchalant, absolutely no fear of the vehicles. And he has quite literally walked within a meter of our vehicles before. So he is a really, really special cat. I mean, there's nothing I don't think like it. And I know there's been some photographs of a black leopard in, in Africa in recent years from the Lycipia area. But for me, this is just on a whole other level. You don't have to go out at night. You don't have to set up camera traps. You can see it in broad daylight right in front of you. 
Um, there's one more uh, video I'll just show you, which was sent to us by our um, ground agents in India. Uh, and this just gives you an idea of, of the encounters uh, on offer. Excuse the sound. Um, so there are three vehicles at the sighting, just to give you an idea. Um, and you can see how close he is. And this is just filmed on a mobile phone. Um, so it really is quite incredible. And he's climbing the tree uh, because there's another leopard up there as well. Uh, so absolutely remarkable to, to be able to witness something such as this. Um, and it is entirely possible on a seven day sort of stint in the park itself. And we go out twice a day, every day. So it really is the best chance you're ever going to get of seeing these magnificent uh, predators in their natural environment. So I'm going to finish there because I think really you can't end on anything sort of more magical than that. It really is quite exceptional. So if you do have any questions, please do send them over. We'll do our absolute best to answer them. Um, I know some of you already sent some through already. Um, and a massive thank you for joining us once again. Uh, we can't thank you enough, really. Um, we're so appreciative. Uh, and if you have any questions at all, my email address is there. Uh, feel free to jot it down and send me a direct question or contact the team. And you can also, of course, order our brochure online as well. So don't forget to do that if you don't have a copy. So thank you very much. Uh, and yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions. Hey, Brett, crikey, you were on fire tonight. Good gracious. That was absolutely amazing. Thank you very, very much. Wasn't that wonderful? Goodness. Um, OK, where do I start? Well, <laughs> firstly, uh, I'm going to ask a question um, to all the lovely people that are on our talk this evening. So they will have received that. Um, OK, where do I start? Um, because I've got quite a lot of questions I, I, I need to go through. Um, yeah, so no firstly, if I may, Brett, just a little bit of a reminder yep. um, of how long it takes to get from um, um, on, uh, on arrival into India um, to the park or to the lodge. So it's about a five hour drive. Um, yep from Bangalore um, to the park itself. Um, typically, what we do is when we arrive uh, in Bangalore, we actually have a, a breakfast uh, or, or something um, at a local hotel, and, and then we transfer you and you can have water and things like that. Um, and then you get to sort of the, the hotel, well, the resort, I suppose, the lodge, whatever you want to call it, um, sort of at lunchtime. Um, so you get a nice meal, but the, the, it's really important to say that the vehicle is a proper sort of bus, like a small bus, yeah, uh, very bus. well maintained uh, with air conditioning. You get two seats usually to yourself because it's only a small group. Um, and it's, yeah, it's very, very good. And Ashwin will meet you um, and take you the, the away. So you'll be sort of well looked after throughout. Bye Ashwin, good old Ashwin. Um, and uh, just a, a reminder also of, of how far Cabini River Lodge is from the National Park. Again, I know you mentioned it right at the beginning, yeah, yeah. but it's, quite, yeah. it's quite, quite an important point, isn't it? Yeah, so it's important to say that the lodge isn't in the park. Like most lodges in India, it's very rare that you get a lodge within the park limits um, because most lodges are privately owned and then the parks are owned by the local authority. Um, but the bizarre thing is, is that the lodge in a uh, Cabini River Lodge is actually owned by the local government, which is fantastic. Um, it employs local people, which is brilliant. Um, and it's situated actually on the sort of the waterway and it's about a 10 minute drive, five to 10 minute drive um, in sort of the vehicle along a road, a tarmac road all the way into the park. And so they basically drive for the, when you're allowed to go in because it's got strict opening times. Uh, and on, upon arrival at the gates, you have to sign in and then you're allowed to go off into the park. So, so Brett, a couple of game drives a day, as, yep. as we might do if we were in Africa, for example, and in, yep. and in other um, part, parts of the world too. Um, yep. what, what time do you normally kick off on your first morning drive? So it, it's usually, I think the park opens at 6am, I seem to remember. I think it changes at the time of year, depending on the daylight. Sure. Um, but you're not allowed during the park during the middle of the day. That, that's a real, there's just no flexibility with that. That is the way it is. 
Um, so you go out for the morning and then you're typically out, I'd say for three hours uh, and then you return to the lodge. Um, and then, you know, you've got your sort of lunch in the middle of the day and uh, maybe a bit of a time for a siesta in the middle of the day as well. Uh, and then you go out in the afternoon. Um, I think it's about 3 p.m. until about 6 p.m. when it starts to get dark again. It's pretty equatorial in terms of light. So you get just over 12 hours yeah. a day of light. So, yeah. um, but you're not allowed to stay in the park after sundown. Uh, and if you are a long way into the, one of the zones, um, be prepared for some speedy driving. Speedy driving, yes. Speedy uh, Indian driving, more to the Indian point. Driving, they don't want to get yeah. <laughs> um, But they will, yeah. they will always make sure you're hot after at the same time. So. Yes, yes. H hang on to your hats, your cameras, yes. your binoculars, and everything else, your clothes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, Fiona has asked, uh, again, something which you, which you did answer, but um, Fiona has asked the best time to visit and what's the weather like? Is it, is it going to be particularly hot? Are you likely yeah. to get rain? So one of the nicer things about being sort of in the foothills of the Western Ghats, so to speak, is it's kind of a more stable climate than other parts of India. So whereas northern India, you get these very wet monsoons and then very dry, extremely hot 40 degree plus summers. Um, it's not quite as extreme in Nagaholi, um, but typically the best time to go is from, I would say, January through to April. Um, in January, you'll get cool mornings, warm days, cool nights, uh, can be cold, need a fleece, I would say, on, on a morning drive. Um, and you quite often get mists through the forest as well. And that's the same yeah, into February. Mm -hmm. And then the later on through the year, it warms up um, and then you can expect daytime temperatures. Um, when I went, which was in April of 30 to 35. Uh, and nighttime temperatures of 20 typically, so not too hot. Um, and, but hot. humid, Brett, or not? So, I mean, no, it's not particularly, um, like kind of comfortable. It's not, I wouldn't say it's a complete dry heat, but it's not a tropical heat either, if that makes no. sense. I was going to say 30, 35 if it's dry can be can be very manageable, but 35 yeah, yeah. if it's like 98% humidity. Yeah, no, it's not, it's not that sort of tropical rainforest humidity at all. No. As you can see in this last picture, actually, it's quite dry yeah. at that time of year. So, um, and you, I mean, you, because of the hills here, you can get a shower. Um, doesn't happen that often, but it's not unheard of to get a shower. Uh, but typically it is quite a dry heat. It's not, it's not unbearably humid at all. Um, it's a lot more pleasant than sort of going to the rainforest, that's for sure. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. Um, one or two people have, have asked whether we can add extensions. And of course, the answer to that is absolutely 120%. Yeah. Yes. I mean, there's some lovely things you could do beforehand, isn't there? Yeah. And equally lovely things we could do afterwards. Um, yeah. Extensions. I mean, there's other amazing places in Southern India. You can go for all sorts of things, such lion maned macaques. And uh, yeah. there's some great places for birding as well. But then you could also even link up because of the fact you're not far from uh, Bangalore you can then easily catch another flight to somewhere else um, and combine it with other tiger reserves and, you know there's so much you could do there really is you could presumably I mean you could also link up with um, you know you could go over to Sri Lanka for yeah, yeah. argument's sake yeah. and, or, and up into Nepal or yeah, there's exactly. all, any number of exciting different extension yeah. options we could we could come yeah, up with absolutely. So. and there's also several ways you can fly there you don't obviously have to fly direct to Bangalore so if you wanted to go somewhere yeah. first you could then fly on so yeah yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, um, so other other pertinent questions. Uh, how many people in a jeep? That's been asked by two or three different people. Yeah, so six, um, six people in the jeep. So um, two to a row, very comfortable, not cramped at all. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of traditional African safari, really. Um, so, and, and as you can see, unlike the Maruti Suzuki's, where they try and cram in terrifying numbers of people. Um, they're yeah. quite spacious in comparison, so it's actually quite comfortable. Yeah, it, um, th 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 that's about as close to an African safari vehicle as you can get, isn't it? Yeah, thing, yeah, exactly. I mean, they're really comfortable comparatively to lots of the sort of yeah. run-down government-owned Jeeps, you know, that are operated in the parks. And do the vehicles always have the roofs on? Do sort of they, it's a sunscreen, I guess, to a degree. Yeah, primarily. Um, yeah, they typically do. Uh, all the ones, that I think we had three different vehicles when we were there and they were always the same driver, but they always had the same roof. So, um, yeah, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't a problem, to be honest, um, because typically the, the, the way the, the roads are, if you're going to see a leopard in a tree, it's at an angle where you're not looking straight up at it. It's not no, like sure. Africa where you go and park underneath the tree. Um, so it's not so much of an issue. 
No, sure. Maybe not quite so good for photographing raptors overhead, but no, no, you know, exactly. You... But it, I mean, it's still there's an element of compromise, cool. isn't there? With every yeah. vehicle, you've got a vehicle without a lid on it, and it's boiling hot. Then you, yeah, you, exactly, you, you get sunburned. Yeah. So, um, um, one or two people have also asked about um, whether whether we rotate the seating. Uh, yeah, I don't mean physically think... rotate the seats, obviously. Yeah, that would be a good trick. Um, <laughs> So, yes, we do. So, I mean, what we normally do is, well, when I'm leading, for example, I will always ask people in the front row to then go to the middle, then to the back and then to the front after each game drive. So, um, you know, you make sure everybody gets a, an equal opportunity. Um, and typically, Ashwin, I, I'm pretty sure, would uh, politely suggest that that is what people do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah ab absolutely. I mean, it's, it's uh, uh, more often than not, that just happens naturally anyway, yeah, doesn't it? It does, yeah. Occasionally, people need a, a, a gentle reminder, but uh, yeah, yeah fair, fair enough. Um, okay, uh, so other other sort of specifics on 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 that trip because, of course, uh, it's uh, it's a particularly um, it's a, it's a cracker of a trip, isn't it? Basically, um, group can 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 you tell us a bit about group size, Brett, on on that one? That that would be a help. So it is um, just because we have only the one guide um, and because the local guides aren't necessarily uh, fluent in English, they speak a little bit of English um, and we rely on Ashwin, who is his English is probably better than mine, to be honest. We only have a group of six and, and we just stick with him as the guide. Um, and then that way, number one, you've got a brilliant naturalist. Um, yeah. You've got someone that can pull all the strings uh, and, you know, nobody misses out. So it's it's quite important. To keep those that's, small groups that's 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 really good um so goodness gracious uh, there's still um loads of questions and I, <laughs> and I know we're not going to get through them all um so i, I mean i just knowing i know you've been to india a number of times and i know you've yeah. been to lots and lots of the of the parks um but sort of as a gut feel how, how would you rate this park um, um, by comparison with others that you've been to in India? Let's put it this way. The next time I go back to India, I want to go back to Nagaholi. <laughs> um, it's, I mean, I, I, like you say, I've been very, very lucky. And yeah, I've been okay. able to... I mean, it kind of says it all, doesn't it? When, when we have the opportunity to go anywhere. Yes, yeah, so I'm really, really lucky that I, I can say, having been to all these different places, and, you know, I really, I have been to all the sort of prime tiger sort of wildlife reserves, um, such as Bandavgar, Kana, Taraba. Um, you know, I'm really lucky. The only one I haven't done really is Rantambore, but, um, mm. you know, I'll get there one day, hopefully. Um, but Nagaholi genuinely is a delight, partly because there's so few vehicles in the park. Um, that's a game changer. Secondly, it's kind of unknown, which kind of makes it magical yeah. as well. And thirdly, the wildlife sightings, well, hopefully you saw from the photographs, uh, you know, I mean, to see 14 tigers in, in a week That's is amazing. remarkable and then to see uh, that number of leopards at the same time and then all the bird life and all the other mammals and wild elephants and sloth bear um you know i don't know how you beat that really <laughs> um, <laughs> well likewise uh, and what what about any of the smaller cats are there any of the smaller cats that, that you might see there <laughs> yeah probably. they are but i mean the chance of seeing them jungle cats probably the most likely one really you're gonna see uh i don't think you're gonna you might see them if you're lucky but a jungle cat you have a chance of seeing but it's, unlikely it's luck of the draw if they happen to be on the edge of a track or you know if there's a bit of empty sort of landscape and they have to be walking across it um they are there yeah yeah fair enough fair enough um you're right about the excitement incidentally and the and the build up to seeing a, to seeing tiger it, yeah. it, you know having experienced it myself on a number of occasions it, there there is something qu quite peculiarly specific about the yeah. excitement of seeing a tiger and the build up of seeing a tiger definitely than any other predator i think perhaps yeah yeah i think the only other encounter i've ever had that kind of elicits a similar emotion is probably gorillas oh that's interesting yeah like it's just i don't know it's that wow factor i guess they're just, but yeah and they're gigantic as well well as are gorillas but there's there's something yeah i mean they are huge i mean a male lion is big but i think 
It sounds weird. I think because they have the mane, they don't look as big. No, and then I, yeah, they're I tiger, agree. and they're so spelt and sort of. But it's the stripes as well, though, isn't it? To an extent, like yeah, yeah. I, mean, I don't know. It's just something. Yeah, they've got an aura. <laughs> they're they are amazing. They are most most amazing animals. Um, so look, a uh, couple of people have commented on uh, trips in 2022 and beyond, um, and um, on, on the one hand, um, are we planning to put on more trips? On the other hand, are we planning to put on any dedicated photographic trips? <laughs> well, the, so the first one, I think about more trips, it's difficult with availability. Um, we always try and obviously meet demand. Uh, it's, it's tough on this one though, isn't it? It's not that easy with this one. I mean, we keep having to add more and more departures continuously. Um, on the photography one, it is actually something we've discussed um, and it is a possibility. Um, but at the moment, we don't have anything set in stone. So, but if there is interest for it, then yeah, definitely let us know because it's something we have seriously considered um, trying to find time uh, <laughs> to do it. There's definitely interest. Uh, I yeah, I can see that already yeah, from there. It's, it's something we've definitely talked about, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Um, and it, it could be, yeah, spectacular. If I mean, all these pictures, I, I should say, that I took on this trip genuinely were quick snaps. They weren't sort of, it's not like a photography tour where you just sit and you yeah. come up late and you, yeah. you build up photograph after photograph. These were literally, I was using binoculars and then I was just like, oh, take a few pictures and then put my binoculars back up again. Yeah, um, and that's because I was leading a, a non-photographic tour, so they really were yeah, just course. quick snaps. So yeah, um, I mean, I, I I know Lance, for example, took thousands of photographs, whereas I only took I think three hundred in the week, which for me is nothing. Some of Lance's photos are absolutely super, aren't yeah, they're they? They're brilliant. Yeah. He's very annoying. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, thank you very much, Lance, for that. We do very much appreciate it. Um, <laughs> I guess there are, are there fees to take cameras into the park? Yes, yeah, so that's an important thing to say, actually. So, yeah, what we do, you have a daily fee. And annoyingly, as a Westerner, we have to pay more than the locals, um, which is quite ironic when a lot of the locals have got 500 mil, 800 mil lenses and all this sorts of stuff. Um, but it is the way it is. Uh, and typically what we do yeah. is we pay at the end of the trip. Um, Right. And they did have a card machine working when I was last there. I don't know whether that's still the case, so we have to check. Um, but they're they're very okay with you just paying at the end. They're not worried about you paying each day as you go in. They just make a record of it. Um, that's very good. And you do have to pay more for a bigger lens. <laughs> Fair enough, I suppose. Well, because I guess if people have got a bigger lens, maybe they've got more money to spend on bringing it into the park i mean that's, that's the theory i think yeah. i'm sure that's the thinking yeah absolutely yeah, exactly except for if you're indian it doesn't matter <laughs> <laughs> well you can have an 800 mil lens and pay like 50 rupees or something <laughs> um brett look you can see as well we've got lots more questions but it's now yeah. uh, just cruising towards 20 to 9 and yeah. um uh, your presentation was absolutely magnificent. Thank you so much. Um, you. To those uh, whose questions we haven't managed to get to, I do apologise, but we will come to those over the course of the uh, over the course of the next couple of days. The the, the guys in our in our sales team will, will will come back to you with answers to your questions, uh, which we would be really delighted to do. Um, just a, a quick promotion before we go for the next presentation which is actually on the 5th of May which I think is next Wednesday um, which is uh, Helen um, doing a doing a, a lunchtime talk an in-depth talk on the great whales of Mexico's Pacific coast um, and uh, I, I will leave you all with um, oh, now of course I can't actually oh there we go I'll leave you all with with one comment uh, which has been made by David um, a rather lovely comment by David who says I'm speechless India has never been on my radar to visit. It is now. Thank you so much. Another stunning presentation. Well done, Brett. Thank you so much. Glad um, I can inspire. <laughs> <laughs> um, and thank you, everybody, for joining us again. Um, I hope you have a lovely bank holiday weekend, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks. Cheerio.